So um, this paper is um, digital archaeological data uh, an examination of different publishing models or if I'd had the, um, the title of the paper in June before I'd done my research, um, now not intended for casual readers, making archaeological data accessible, which is a new title. And the paper is based on an examination of 150 websites from institutions that have archaeological data from Virginia projects. Um, so the purpose of the survey um, was to answer the following question. So in examining current dis dissemination practices, how are digital archaeology data made accessible? Um, are the characteristics supporting aspects of scholarly publishing? Um, to what extent are websites presenting archaeological data from Virginia projects aligning with the requirements of open data? And um, are the characteristics supporting aspects of public outreach? So a little bit of um, background for this. Uh, archaeological data publication has been an integral part of the profession from the beginning. Um, Julian Richards explored this connection, noting the tradition attributed to the 19th century archaeologist um, Pitt Rivers, now my second favorite archaeologist behind my wife. Um, the publication provided an objective record. So for Pitt Rivers, the published report provided a complete and factual record, becoming an indispensable part of the excavation, um, forming, you know, in his, his words, an idea that this uh, publication provides preservation by record. Um, so this concept has changed over time with the exception of value of analysis and synthesis and the idea that any kind of published re report reflects the, the author. But, you know, publication and archaeology is, is tied right to the beginning of the profession. So if we're talking about audience, um, Pitt Rivers also said that his voluminous excavation volumes were, quote, not intended for casual readers. Um, begging the question, which I think is still relevant, about who, the, who are the audiences for archaeological data. Um, while not addressing data explicitly, the ethics of the Society for American Archaeology asks that archaeologists, quote, communicate archaeological interpretations of the past, while SHA's ethics statement asks that archaeologists strive to engage citizens in the research process and publicly disseminate the major findings of their research, a bit more active. Um, so archaeology itself is a, a very public profession, and there's a wide and varied audience for its results. Um, not one constituency, you know, archaeologists, um, nor two, as is commonly stated, you know, archaeologists and the, quote, public, um, but a wide and diverse set of publics uh, with different needs and interests. So there's many definitions of what that audience is. Again, going back to SAA, there's a... Um, the, Ethics statement says um, students and teachers, Native Americans, and other ethnic, religious, and cultural groups who find in the archaeological record important aspects of their cultural heritage, lawmakers and government officials, reporters, journalists, and others involved in the media and the general public. And then Teresa Moy is a Park Service archaeologist in, in defining audience split into two main groups, uh, employees and volunteers of historical societies and museums, collections managers and administrators, and then educators, college and university professors, researchers in various fields, interpreters, artists, local communities, and descendants group. The point being there, you know, there's multiple audiences with, with perhaps different needs, and you know, where does data fit into that? So a quick um, reference to some definitions for, that took part, form part of the survey. Archaeological data here is being used very broadly. Uh, as everybody in this room knows, archaeological Archaeologists create a wide range of data, site reports, catalogs, spatial, um, just talking to Bernard Means with his 3D data that he's creating. And the survey kind of looked at all types of data. Um, Virginia projects uh, were chosen for this study for several reasons, but one was because of the um, work done by Esther White and Eleanor Breen in their um, survey of archaeological repositories in Virginia. This was a, a report done a couple of years ago and they were looking at physical collections. They gave a paper on this last year, um, looking at access to physical collections and um, repositories in Virginia that had um, collections of archaeological material. Um, so that repository survey formed the basis of um, the institutions that I looked at. So kind of the conceptual framework for looking at these websites 
Uh, they're examined through three overlapping areas, um, in reference back to those questions at the beginning, scholarly publishing, open data, and public outreach. Um, there's a number of kind of general, just kind of housekeeping fields that are captured um, that you can see there, as well as the um, types of data um, present on the site. Um, sites that only had summary information um, were recorded in the survey, but only for the public outreach fields. Um, scholarly publishing, um, so what are the considerations in making this data useful to other archaeologists and other academics? There's increasing interest in looking at comparative collections. We've had just had their SHA blog um, by um, Julie King talking about this. Um, but there's also considerable difficulty in comparing data from different sites with issues of preservation as well as interoperability of data. Um, Mellon Foundation in its annual report in 2008 said, quote, there are no commonly agreed upon standards and little capacity for preserving and providing access to the databases, electronic field notes, digital images, and other materials that document archaeological findings. Now, the situation's improved, I think, a lot since 2008. There are national options for publishing. Um, TDAR provides an excellent preservation platform. Uh, Open Context is working on some issues of interoperability. Uh, Internet Archaeology Magazine, uh, which is based out of England, um, has completed two LEAP projects that allow readers to the opportunity to drill down seamlessly from the publication into the archive to test interpretations and develop their own conclusions. And there's also the um, Journal of Open Archaeology Data. Um, as yet, however, these seem to be little use for um, Virginia projects. So I think it's still worth looking at what's actually happening on you know, Virginia sites. Um, so the things we were looking at was how are these data are licensed, how can they can be manipulated and re reused, how can they be cited, is there provision for these data to be archived and therefore be available in the future, um, are there tools provided um, on the website for analysis, so the fields have got the citation licensing, URIs, um, permanence and archiving and analysis tools. So in reference to um, open data, um, so the open data movement has grown considerably in the last few years, um, driven in part by a desire to allow public access, access to government data. Um, open in this context is defined as data that anyone can freely use, modify and share for any purpose, subject most to requirements that preserve um, provenance and openness. Um, the government aspect is important here because it's become a requirement for federal granting agencies. Uh, White House directive asking for, quote, a strategy for improving the public's ability to locate and access digital data resulting from federally funded scientific research. So there's a push to get data out and make it available. So for the purpose of this study, I'm looking at um, type of data. And at this point, by type of data, what I'm talking about is whether it's text, whether it's structured data, non-proprietary structured data, or linked open data. Also, um, aspects of access, accessibility, um, and evidence of a data dictionary, something describing the, the fields used. For public outreach, um, we've already talked about this, that archaeologists have this ethical obligation to share their research, and there has long been a public outreach component of archaeology. Digital dissemination is part of this, with the possibility of reaching a number of audiences and allow engagement through interactivity, feedback, and comments um, with the research. So Carol McDavid's early paper on the Levi Jordan website included the desire to incorporate elements of reflexivity, multivocality, interactivity, and contextuality. Um, and then, the, so we have the web support for readers to engage in a conversation, um, what we now reference as kind of web 2.0, allowing at least the possibility of a, a kind of a democratization of knowledge and allowing other voices into the archaeological discourse, um, though whether the you know, website kind of overpowers the other voices I think is still a question. Um, sites supporting social media have provided new ways of engagement on the web. Uh, equally, equally important for public outreach is a context-rich environment in which the data exists thematically, spatially, and temporally. And for the purposes of archaeological advocacy, a sense of the process of archaeology as well as the results. Finally, is the website being used as a tool of outreach for the community, as well as providing opportunities for engagement through open houses, field schools, education, and other programming. 
So for this part, I was looking at um, summary, whether it's summary information, contact information, blog, social media, uh, contextual information, media, outreach, and education. So half now it's to get to the, the doing part. Um, at this point, data collection has been completed, though I'm still doing analysis. So some preliminary re results. Um, looking at the websites, they broke down into three broad groups. Those with no mention of archaeology, those with only summary reports, or a broad discussion of archaeology, and the last group with archaeological data. Now, there's some problems with counts here. You know, the unit of analysis of a website, but yeah, there are some web places that kind of have multiple sites, and some multiple sites that had multiple organizations affiliated with them. Um, but remembering that all of these institutions have identified as having archaeological collections. Um, clearly, many of these institutions are not sharing archaeology as part of their web presence. You get 75% of sites here, of institutions here that aren't mentioning archaeology at all, despite having, as we know, archaeology. Um, regarding public outreach, so we're looking at the um, 26 sites here. Um, 26, 39 sites. There was. Um, no consistent template here for public engagement beyond providing contextual information, which nearly 80% of the websites include. Most sites have taken advantage of a rich visual, percent, visual potential of archaeology um, in showing media. Um, the other two factors that appear on the majority of sites are outreach and um, summary information, outreach slightly higher. Um, the number of site summaries was just over half, 55%. Um, with institutions communi inf communicating information about archaeological sites in a written format. And then the blogging and social media numbers likely reflect, at least in part, the more active you know, archaeological programs. For open data, um, just over half of the 26 sites with data shared data through site reports, which means that of the, of the 150 sites I looked at, only, only 11 had easily shareable data, and one of those had it in a kind of proprietary format. Um, when you also add in that four of these sites were part of DAX, which is the Digital um, Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, um, which along with Culture in Boston, another website was the only one that had data dictionary de detailing how fields were used, we're not seeing a great deal of effective sharing information here. I would included the accessibility because of the possibility of finding 3D data or GIS data that required browser plugins, that wasn't the case. Um, there were no accessibility issues. The only site that required a login was the um, Virginia Sites Database, which is VCRIS. None of the sites were using linked open data or um, the CDOC CRM, which is a standard which we're seeing a lot more in Europe now. Um, scholarly publishing, in a, in a broad sense, could be seen as you know all of these fields. Um, the six characteristics we looked at, there were no um, uniform resource identifiers, URIs used on any of the sites. And there was no reference to um, how this data was being archived. That's not to say that these places aren't thinking about that, but it wasn't apparent on the website how that information is being preserved into the future. I think there's an argument for suggesting that's a useful thing to share. Um, the licensed data that I've put in there is kind of a problematic field. I had some problems in translating how people were allowing their data to be used. So I was trying to use a CC license as a common framework, and I've got some work to do to kind of map that data to make it fit together. And also, there was a surprising lack of clear contact information on the websites for people that were interested in follow-up about the collections. Um, you'd think that would be a very easy thing to put in, and it wasn't there on all sites. The survey um, is in no way intended to be a critique of individual sites, nor is it the suggestion that all websites should be all things to all audio audiences. Um, you know, clearly looking at these sites, and the ones on the left are there, um, they're the data ones, the smaller group on the right are the ones that had archaeology but no, no data. Um, I'm willing to make changes if anybody wants to yell that my site does have data and you just missed it, but you know, it should be easy to see. Um, you know, DAX again is, is, is kind of exemplar here. Um, citation and licensing are explicit. Collections have a rich set of contextual data which has been extended to make the material more accessible to multiple audiences. There are, um, and if you if your site had a links to DAX, then it counted as having as data. Um, there are other sites that have provide found ways of providing valuable content, 
And there are no longer technical barriers to doing this. I mean, in terms of putting up a site report as a PDF, it's not beyond anybody's technical know-how to do that now. So these aren't technical barriers to doing this. These are, there are other kind of barriers to why this information isn't getting shared. Um, websites with characteristics supporting open data, scholarship, and public outreach provide many benefits. The broad importance of access to digital data, and in particular digital collections to archaeologists, is reflected in the SHA survey, and there's a three-minute shout out on that for the session tomorrow, looking at the survey results and how important um, digital data is to, to archaeologists according to the survey. A national survey of repositories in 2010 asked how important is the collection, curation, and access to digital data to your organization, with nearly 50% answering highly important. And there's another quote from, um, as consumers, archaeologists genuinely desire effective online access to the results of others' work. The problems are only getting more complex as we're integrating different data sets, managing diverse vocabularies, and supporting emergent data forms, GIS, 3D models, and such. So um, that's the shout out for tomorrow's three minute thing. Um, finally, so what questions does all of this raise? Um, I think there's a uh, relevance in advocacy for archaeology. You know, what's the difference between archaeology and pot hunting? I would suggest data is a large part of that. Um, showing a few ab objects on a website devoid of context is supporting the view that it's all about the treasure. And I don't really see that anymore, but it's very important, I think, even if the public isn't in a place to go through the data, they need to know the data is there. Um, who gets to decide who owns this data? Um, questions of authority, trust, provenance, gatekeepers and ownership. Um, what knowledge do you need to use the data? There's questions here of information literacy, um, object and discipline metadata. What kind of archaeological knowledge do you need to impart for people to be able to use this? Is, you know, to what extent is this um, making data available to these publics? Um, there's still a question. If we go back to the COVA survey, there's a, a lack of access to the existing physical collections. There's now a lack of access, we can note, to the digital collections as well. There's a preservation access, uh, um, preservation problem. We can add digital data to the curation crisis. And I put locks in there, um, this idea of lots of copies keep stuff safe. Um, sharing data, it's a good way of preserving it because you know, it's like those papers that people printed off from 1970 that somebody's got in a file cabinet somewhere, you know? If you share it, then somebody's going to turn up with it somewhere. Uh, interoperability, um, this is a profession that kind of prides itself on a lack of standards, something which is becoming more problematic now if people want to share data. And finally, um, with people's interest in digital data, I think what it means is that the, data, the digital data sets that are out there are going to get used over and over and over again. So people are going to end up writing papers, I think, on a much more limited set of information. Because I think, you know, basically people younger than me um, are looking digitally for digital access to information rather than going back out to the collections. And I think that's a problem if we don't make more digital data sets available. So, um, committee willing, final results in May. Thank you very much.